Uh, I come to Yale this year from Indiana University, where I was a professor of English for 17 years, and I directed the cultural studies program. My teaching and research there and now here largely explore the historical and theoretical relationship between Black literature and Black performance. So what I thought I would do today is just share some of the archival work that informs my scholarship and talk a little bit about the way I approach the archive, a kind of show and tell of the work that I have done. So let me share my screen uh, and begin by saying a little bit about my first book, The Scene of Harlem Cabaret, which began from my curiosity about why so many novelists, essayists, and poets of the Harlem Renaissance featured cabaret and other nightlife performances so prominently in their work. And when they did, often in avant-garde and experimental ways. Uh, cabarets and the music and performances that they fostered occupied a key place in Harlem Renaissance debates about the value of high and low cultural forms and the proper subject matter for Black arts and letters. While many uh, intellectuals and community leaders worried that nightlife was at odds with advancing more positive images of Blackness, a number of younger writers found new opportunities for racial and sexual self-definition in the cabaret. But why? Why did they? In the book, I, I explore two related questions. First, how did the unique conventions of cabaret performance, its architecture, its atmosphere, its performance style, shape social and racial relations in the early 20th century? And second, how were these relationships taken up in literature of the time? In the 1920s, Harlem boasted scores of nightclubs from large establishments that sat several hundred people and offered elaborate floor shows to cramped basement cellars with small jazz bands. As this novelty map captures, right, this is a, a nightclub map of Harlem that, that gives us a kind of subterranean social and performance geography that it brings to the surface. And the Beinecke, in fact, acquired this image uh, in this 1932 illustration by Black artist E. Sims Campbell a few years ago, thanks in part to the tenacious energy of curator Melissa Barton. Nightclubs like these created unique social spaces by combining the food and drink service of restaurants with the performances of the theater and the dance hall. Rather than taking place on a stage, musical acts and dance routines would take place on the floor among the patrons seated at tables allowing for an informal relationship between performer and spectator and among the spectators themselves. So this is an image of the interior of the Cotton Club and you can see the bandstand on the far, uh, the far side of the image and the tables and chairs crowded around the thrust stage that fills the space. Uh, the staircase right at the front of the image that allowed performers to flow off of the, the stage and circulate among the spectators and the patrons having their own social space while the performance was going on. It's another institution of Harlem's nightlife, Connie's Inn. And you begin to see when you look at more and more of these images of the interiors of cabarets, how the low ceilings create a kind of horizontality in contrast to the verticality of Broadway, Broadway theaters or even the, the skyscrapers that were transforming uh, New York City's skyline in the 1920s. Uh, what we get in looking at these images is a sense of the cabaret's architecture of intimacy that created and sustained this distinctly modern form of public intimacy. And much of my research for this book was driven by an attempt to read the archival traces and the ephemera of these spaces to better understand the evanescent experiences that were organized by nightlife performance. And partly what that means is imagining these spaces, this is Small's Paradise, another uh, major institution of the Harlem Renaissance, to imagine these spaces when they're filled with performers. Here you see Cab Calloway in the Cotton Club uh, with the line of chorus dancers in the background. Uh, this is a review in uh, at Connie's Inn. And this was one of my favorite images, uh, an unidentified basement cabaret that you can see the, the tables and the drinks have been abandoned mid-conversation as the patrons rush to the dance floor to perform and, and fill the space with their own sociality. So in the book, I show how poets and novelists like Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, 
Nella Larson and Claude McKay turned to Harlem's nightclubs, not simply as objects for literary representation, but how they drew from cabaret performances, architecture of intimacy to conjure queer black worlds in literature and print culture. And I ultimately argue that, that this literature, these poems and novels are themselves a kind of performance that extends the performances of nightlife into print culture. And I put these writers in conversation with the performers who inspired them, women like Ada Bricktop Smith, Ethel Waters and Adelaide Hall, who all wrote about their performances, further developing in their autobiographies and interviews, the kind of public intimacy and feminist self-definition that they enacted on stage. And this was especially the case for the focus of my book's last chapter, Lena Horne, who wrote movingly and incisively about her experience performing across the color line in segregated cabarets. So Horn's, Horn's career reminds us that as much as public intimacy can build new worlds, it can also be an occasion for violence and hostility. Performing for white audiences, Horn developed a strategy of aloofness that frustrated her audience's desire for intimate access to her performance despite the conventions of cabaret. I developed this theory of Horn's impersonal persona through her own writing about performance, as well as looking at archival images and reviews and listening to her, her recordings, which are themselves a kind of sonic archive of the time. So while I was researching Lena Horn, I discovered that in 1957, she appeared in the Middlebrow Calypso musical Jamaica, her only stage role in her long and storied career. What was this icon of the civil rights movement, this pioneer in black musical performance and the quintessence of elegance doing in this kitschy piece of Broadway Caribbeana? Trying to understand this question led me to the archive of my second book, Stolen Time, Black Fad Performance and the Calypso Craze. So in Stolen Time, I tell the history of that fleeting year and a half in the late 1950s when middle-class US consumers made Calypso music the top selling genre in the nation. For a time, it even threatened to supplant rock and roll. Calypso had made inroads into US recording studios as early as the 1910s. But when Harry Belafonte's 1956 album Calypso unexpectedly became the first LP record to sell over a million copies, the novelty of Calypso cascaded into a mass cultural fad. Um, this is an image of, of Belafonte's Calypso and also Josephine Premis, another important performer who recorded two Calyp albums of Calypso music during the Calypso craze. This one was also called Calypso. So in Stolen Time, I placed the fad in a tradition of popular performance in the US that I characterize as black fad performance. And I mean by that term to describe a framework for understanding the cycles of repetition and difference that shaped race, entertainment, and mass culture during the Jim Crow era. And I inquire into how African-American appropriations of Afro-Caribbean cultures uh, how these appropriations explored and, and how the fad helped shape a diasporic consciousness as African-American performers engaged with Caribbean musical and performance traditions. Like in the scene of Harlem Cabaret, I approach the Calypso craze from my position in the interdisciplinary field of performance studies. So I look not only at the, the musical aspects and the recordings of the Calypso craze, but I also trace the Calypso craze across its theatrical, choreographic, cinematic, and televisual aspects. The craze happened everywhere. Calypso concerts were staged at Carnegie Hall and the Apollo Theater. Nightclubs such as the Village Vanguard in New York City and the Blue Angel in Chicago converted themselves into Calypso rooms that featured elaborate Calypso reviews. Hollywood studios hurriedly released films such as Bop Girl Goes Calypso and Calypso Heatwave that took those performances from the nightclub and translated them to the screen featuring popular Calypso acts, including a young Maya Angelou who also recorded a Calypso album under her nickname, Miss Calypso. Television specials 
featured Calypso singers and Caribbean dancers in prime time, including the CBS broadcast of Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn's A Drum is a Woman, featuring dancer choreographer Carmen de Lavalade. So this live presentation on CBS was an hour long theater dance music suite that combined elements of Afro-Caribbean music with swing and bebop to tell a fable about the history of jazz in the African musical diaspora. In addition to, so I, I look more closely at the archives of all of these discrete performances and see them in the, in the larger uh, kind of tapestry of the Calypso craze itself. In addition to Belafonte and Josephine Premis and Maya Angelou and Carmen de Lavalade, another major figure of the Calypso craze was de Lavalade's partner in dance and in marriage, Jeffrey Holder. Holder emigrated from Trinidad at the age of 23 and immediately became a fixture of black theatrical and modernist dance scenes of mid-century New York City. He also helped start a Calypso dance craze. In May of 1957, Glamour magazine treated readers to a Calypso themed issue that featured an eight page photo spread spotlighting Holder as he instructed readers how to dance the limbo Calypso. And this was one significant way that the Calypso craze moved through the dispersal of gestures, steps, and spins. Recreational dance was the corporeal infrastructure of the fad itself. And I love this image of a, of a dance hall featuring a Calypso band. In the foreground, you can see the, the straw hats and the steel pan drums and an interracial crowd that is dancing on the dance floor. The craze of uh, the dance craze of the Calypso fad is also one of the reasons why the Calypso craze ended. The youth market of you know, popular culture found Calypso hard to dance to, and they enjoyed dancing more to rock and roll than to Calypso. And where the youth market money went, so went uh, mass culture, and rock and roll eventually surpassed Calypso as a, a, a longer lasting. Uh, phenomenon. While I was finishing this book and learning more about Jeffrey Holder, I was surprised to discover that he appeared on Broadway during the Calypso craze in a Black cast production of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. And this little known bit of Black theater history is the starting point of my current research, what I'm working on now. Waiting for Godot is the prime example of the theater of the absurd the post-World War II drama that explored existential questions about humans' search for meaning in a meaningless world. Playwrights like Beckett, Eugene Ionesco, Jean Genet, and others abandoned the rules of plot, character, and dialogue, deeming them insufficient to the task of staging the contingency of existence, and they attempted to find other more experimental ways to stage such meaninglessness. So Jeffrey Holder, who joined uh, other really remarkable Black actors, Earl Hyman, Mantan Moreland, and Rex Ingram in the cast of this production. As I was learning more about, about this production, which was also very fleeting, it only had six, six, it only ran for six nights of its Broadway engagement before it closed. Uh, I began to discern a different theater of the absurd that was before and beyond the European tradition of the theater of the absurd. So in my new work, I have, I have two aims. Number one is to excavate the Africanist presence in the canonical European theater of the absurd. And number two, and more importantly, is to delineate a tradition of the racial absurd in the United States, the Caribbean, and post-colonial Africa that was developed by black performers from the 18th century through the present in response to the formal meaninglessness and incoherencies of racism. So across uh, all of this work, I hope to advance the performance studies axiom that performance is history and that performance history is performance theory, whether in a Harlem dance floor, a Broadway theater, a sound recording, a Trinidad carnival or a poem. I approach the archive not as a repository of facts and a history, 
uh, but a living space where meaning is an active collaboration and performance across generations. So finally, I'll add that this is something that is especially important to my teaching. This semester, I've regularly brought my Modern American Drama Seminar and my graduate class on Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, and Black Modernism to the Beinecke to engage with the holdings here, working with the curators and students to read literature alongside the manuscripts, fragments, and ephemera of Black performance culture in the Beinecke is really one of the most exciting parts of joining the community here, as well as having brilliant new colleagues like Ernest Mitchell and Eliza Kelly and Jonathan Howard, who will be presenting at Mondays at Beinecke next week. So thank you again for, for your time and thank you, Michael, for inviting me to share this work. Thank you, Shane. And we look forward now to hearing from Professor Mitchell. Great. Can you all hear me? All right. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, and also thank you, Shane, um, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation that I'm really excited to, to engage with. Uh, sort of in the next few minutes and also uh, in the in the days and weeks to come. Thank you so much uh, to to Michael, to Melissa Barton, who's already been mentioned, to our other colleagues, Nancy Cool uh, at the Beinecke um, for for all of your work uh, behind the scenes and and with us as we as we engage in this uh, these endeavors together. So I'm going to share my screen uh, right now. Great. And yeah, so uh, I'd like to talk to a, talk just briefly um, about a project that I'm working on right right now, which is on Claude McKay, um, and for which the Beinecke is is truly uh, a biographer's dream. So I'm actually working on uh, the first biography that's been written on McKay in about 30, almost 35 years. Um, who you may ask, uh, is this Claude McKay? Well, let me move on forward. So this is a, a wonderful, wonderful quote from Arna Bontam, uh, who was a, an incredible sort of black bibliophile and collector of all things related to uh, the Harlem Renaissance, and also best friends with, with Langston Hughes, who McKay was also good friends with. Uh, and Bontem writes uh, to Hughes after McKay's death, right? And Hughes is sort of offering up um, a series of his papers to the Beinecke uh, for what will become the James Walden Johnson papers or collection here. Uh, and he writes, the letters from Claude sound most interesting. You should make copies of them before giving them to Yale. Either you or somebody else will have to write something objective about the controversial poet. It could be a book of widespread general interest if written frankly and with feeling. Claude moved among interesting people at an exciting time he had secret loves and open battles. What better subject could a biographer want? Uh, and I find myself asking, my, asking this on, a, on an almost daily basis uh, and really thanking Bontemps for this insight and Hughes um, for his, his care and dedication in preserving some of these letters, um, which we have in you know, sort of a wealth of uh, here at Beinecke. And so McKay just sort of briefly schematically, right, is born in Jamaica. And so I'm thinking actually quite a bit about the early hi history of Calypso that, that Professor Vogel is, is, is writing, has already written on. Um, and he's born in Jamaica. He's raised there uh, sort of in the Victorian era at the turn of the century um, by a largely farming family. Um, and he makes his uh, sort of exit from the island as a dialect poet. He writes two volumes of dialect poetry uh, that sell out and do in remarkably well on the island and actually throughout the British Empire. On the strength of this, he's able to leave the island, move to the US where he studies agriculture. Uh, suffice to say, he finds this a bit boring uh, and makes his way to Harlem where uh, a number of other compatriots, many of the folks that, um, that Shane has already mentioned, right? Zora Neale Hurston, who I wrote my uh, dissertation on, and a number of other um, black writers and black thinkers are sort of beginning to move to Harlem uh, really in the 19 teens and early 1920s when McKay shows up. Um, and so he's in Harlem briefly, he gets involved in, uh, in left activism, he's a socialist. Um, he 
ends up traveling uh, briefly to Russia and then later through Europe and into Northern Africa and Morocco. He spends about 12 years actually abroad. Um, and while he's doing this, right, he's writing poetry, he's writing novels, he's writing uh, mem later memoirs. Uh, he's just constantly sort of churning out um, writings while living this incredibly peripatetic life, uh, which is a fact that we'll come back to in this presentation. And so one of the things that Beinecke really allows uh, a biographer to do, we have McKay's papers here, and we also have, as it turns out, the papers of a number of his friends uh, and other associates, right? And so as a biographer, Beinecke is an amazing place to be able to actually just sit and really compare the different, uh, you know, sort of texts and other uh, ephemera, right, that have, have been left behind to sort of start to, to piece together a life, right? And not just his life, but actually the kind of network of friendships, of enemieships, <laughs> of political alliances, uh, of aesthetic competition uh, that really made the Renaissance and the years after the Renaissance uh, possible and really exciting. So, you know, so McKay lives this incredibly uh, sort of peripatetic life. And I wanted to just kind of give us a sense of uh, a little bit of what he's up to. So I'm sort of dropping us in, in the middle of the 1920s, um, where he's, you know, by now sort of found himself uh, in the south of France, where he's gone to live cheaply. He's, he really essentially lived only on his writings, uh, and to a certain extent on, uh, you know, sort of what we would see as blue collar work, right? I mean, he does a lot of, um, he's a proletarian, right? So he ends up doing what he can to survive. Uh, he, he really never is the beneficiary until the late, late thirties of the kind of fellowships that many other authors um, were able to get. Uh, and so he writes here to one of his friends and, and sort of sometime patrons, Louise Bryant, uh, who was uh, married to Jack Reed, uh, the activist. And he writes, my dear Louise, uh, I feel pretty certain that if you understood my present desperate position, my hopes, my aspirations, my fears, you might have acted differently about those stories. And so he's sent a few of the short stories that he's been writing uh, to Louise, right, who has, who has been holding on to them. Uh, and he knows not exactly why he finds out later. It is useless to recite uh, how, I sh how I have been struggling to exist this last year. When I sent the stories to you in March, I had just reached the end of my rope. I had been getting $5 for a poem now and then, but a friend had urged me to do some stories and get in on the Negro Vogue. So I dropped the writing of poetry altogether. I wanted to send those stories either to you or to America, right? And so, you know, it's really, it gets to the point when he, when he finally writes to her in 1926 of a kind of life or death thing, right? I mean, he's really um, just scraping by um, and he's trying to find a way to kind of get a volume of stories out. Uh, and what ends up happening actually is that the, the volume of stories that he produces, one of those um, becomes the kind of kernel for uh, his first published novel, Home to Harlem, um, which is essentially the first black bestseller. So, you know, before Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God, before Richard Wright's Native Son, almost a decade before each of those, um, you know, McKay writes this novel really evoking the Harlem that Shane is talking about uh, in his presentation, right? Evoking the Harlem of the, the, the late teens and early twenties, right? Sort of just before prohibition. Um, and so he expands one of these short stories into the novel that's home to Harlem. Uh, Louise in fact does get back to him and, and sort of helps him out with some money as well as uh, uh, you know, a typewriter among other things that helps him to get the, the book written. And so he actually dedicates home to Harlem eventually to her for her help. Um, moving forward, you know, here's one of the early, early um, un unprinted reviews. This is a private review um, in part of Home to Harlem. And so his friend Joe Bennett writes to him immediately upon receipt saying, yours is one of those first works I have read this spring and by far the best. My heartiest congratulations and best wishes for a whopping sale thereof. You know, so she writes from Berlin. Uh, other uh, people write to him from all over the world, including um, F. Scott Fitzgerald, and we have a, a wonderful postcard from him in the Beinecke. Um, he misspells McKay's name, but says some, some very, very nice things about uh, his scenes with uh, the Pullman porters and the sort of influences of Zola and, uh, and Lewis, you know, on him. Um, so this is a kind of fun, uh, 
fun sort of bit in the archive. And you see a lot of these things. There's also the letting, letters from the Hemingways, right? I mean, you know, McKay sort of knows Edna St. Vincent Millay. So one of the things that the archive actually helps us to do is to see the ways in which, um, you know, among other things, right, the Renaissance is never actually racially segregated, right? So in the same way that McKay is reading, you know, sort of Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Gertrude Stein, they're also reading him right, and reading all of his compatriots, right, and they're sort of reviewing each other in, uh, in these friendly and also competitive ways, right, in their letters. Another thing that you'll notice here um, is the kind of multiplicity of, <laughs> uh, of addresses, right, and so we see, you know, this real difficulty in sort of ascertaining exactly where McKay is, you know, is he in Paris, is he in Barcelona, is he in Marseille, is he uh, in uh, Etats Unis, right, in, in the U.S., uh, no, actually, he's in Barcelona. He's in Spain. Um, and this is actually a, a real leitmotif. I mean, McKay moved more often um, and more sort of erratically than almost anyone I've ever uh, met or studied. And so we see this constantly in the archive, right? You know, sort of especially in the late 20s in sort of 1928 and 1931 when McKay is sort of back and forth between uh, Morocco and Spain and occasionally Paris and occasionally the south of France, you know, sort of correspondents uh, all over the world really, really have a tough time kind of pinning him down and, and locating him. And so, you know, I, I, I offer these not only because they're sort of amazing visual documents, but also because having uh, not just the letters, right, but also the envelopes uh, and the postmarks and the stamps uh, in Beinecke really helps us to figure out where McKay is at any given time, um, you know, and when he, when he finds these letters, right? So there's actually an amazing letter that I haven't included um, that someone mails to him on the eve of his departure from Morocco, and he only gets it almost two years later. And so we, when he responds, you know, he really has to sort of apologize for the, the huge lag in, in conversation. But, um, you know, one of the things that the archive gives us is this ability to understand not only you know, sort of exactly when things are written, but how they circulate and when they're finally received. Um, and so I'm going to pause there. There's so much that I could say, and I'm, I invite, you know, any number of questions about McKay's travels, uh, other things that I found in the archive, um, and so on. But I leave you with this wonderful image uh, from Richmond Barthé, uh, who is a, a sculptor of, of, the, of the Renaissance and someone who McKay was quite close with, especially after he returned to the US. Uh, and there's, there's an enormous folder in Beinecke about this big um, with Barthé to uh, McKay. And all that's in it actually is this one little, you know, sort of tiny greeting card, which Barthé made himself. Uh, and it's just on the back is him apologizing to McKay for, for having missed his recent appointment. Uh, and hoping that they will be able to, to meet up and sort of catch up very soon. And so uh, I, I offer you these greetings from the archive and invite you uh, also to, to join the conversation with the two of us right now. Thank you.